Good morning, church. I thought I forgot to turn on my mic, but it was on all the time. How about that? I surprised myself. It is so wonderful to be in this house this morning, isn't it? The cooler weather come in, I love it. The leaves starting to change. I went for a five mile hike on Friday and it was just so awesome. I really didn't want to come home, but I had to because I had to go to the bathroom. So that's, that was the end of that. Hey, altar flowers this morning are given by Jim and Kathy Powers in celebration of our church and where God is leading us. Let us remember Jim and Kathy as they are now in their second week of quarantine. They were around their daughter um, just over a week ago and um, then it was discovered that she tested positive for COVID. So they're in quarantine, but um, so continue to remember them because I know that they would like to be here with us. Um, our radio broadcast today, and we say hi to all those who are listening, is sponsored by Suzanne Gilmore in memory of her mother, Marian Zernley, and sister Marsha Tudor. And now um, we're going to take a pause and I'm going to ask Bill Squibb to come up. Uh, we had a leadership team meeting a week ago, and as we promised, he is coming to inform us of some things we talked about. Thanks, Pastor T. It's once again good to get this thing off. Uh, the leadership team meeting was held last Sunday. Uh, we're scheduled for an hour and a half. We took two hours that we went over, but we had some good discussion during that time. And again, the uh, reason why I'm up here talking about that now is we've talked about uh, keeping the congregation better informed of ongoing events, especially these days with uh, the COVID crisis going on. So some of the highlights from that meeting. We're pleased to announce that uh, some upcoming dates as we prepare to further open up the church. And this coming Tuesday, October 6th, the adult faith formation team will be meeting. And then a couple weeks later, on Thursday, October 22nd, the missions and outreach team will be meeting. Now, if you've ever been involved in either of these teams, you know, please feel free to show up at these meetings. Or if you've never been on these teams and maybe you wonder what's going on with those teams, again, feel free to show up. Or if you're not quite ready to come back because of COVID going on, that's fine too. When you're ready, come on back. We don't want anyone coming back before they're ready to. Leadership team is also uh, doing a review of our properties in preparation of realigning our priorities and what to do with these properties. So there will be a congregational meeting scheduled in the future, and a letter will be sent to the congregation. The Staff Parish Relations Committee, SPRC, has a full slate of team members. Thank you for that. SPRC is led by Susan Stidham, who by default is on the leadership team. And the finance team, they're still looking for volunteers, and this includes counters for the weekly offering. Finance team is led by Nan Clary, and of course she's on the leadership team also. Now, finally, saving the best for last, here's the good stuff. Holidays are approaching. We can expect more people to be in church. They want to attend services as we get further into these holiday seasons. So the leadership team is looking at ways of getting more people in the building for these services. So bear with us as we undergo some changes, and uh, more details will be coming out about that in the near future. If you have any questions, I'm going to hang out in the chapel lab. Excuse me, after the service. So feel free to stop by, discuss all you want, questions, I'll try to get answers, or just chat. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bill. And uh, just, um, I'd just like to emphasize a couple of things, and that is that for the meetings, we're going to hold them here in the sanctuary so that people can spread out. Um, also, uh, if people are wanting to be involved but don't feel that they want to come and be present um, person to person, um, I am going to hold Zoom meetings, so you need to call Peg and tell her you're interested, and then I'll set up a Zoom meeting. And if you don't like Zoom and you still want to be involved and don't want to be here, we can always go to the old-fashioned phone call, right? So I want people not to use COVID as an excuse, and we're gonna talk about excuses today. Sorry, I don't take any excuses. The second thing is, I can't stress enough what Bill was saying. We need to build a finance team. And I don't know people well enough yet, otherwise I'd be coming to you and saying, what's your excuse for non-volunteering? So, 
I need people to volunteer for our finance team. Right now, it's Nan, and that's it. Nan can't do it alone. In fact, Nan was supposed to go off the board um, this coming year, and she has agreed so graciously to be able to stay on so we can build a team. So, um, if you are feeling that way inclined, and you don't have to know all about finances, I don't, and I'm the pastor and in charge of them. How, how silly is that, right? No, they help me along, um, and we have some uh, great ideas, so we need people. So please, send forth your names. And now let us prepare for worship, as together we say the call to worship. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple, must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. And now won't you join in the hymn, Take Up Thy Cross, Let Us Stand.
As we come to our morning time of prayer again, I want to thank all those who are sending in their offerings, who are bringing their offerings on Sunday mornings. Um, for we um, are a thriving church. Amen. And we, uh, God's work has not been stopped on the earth because of COVID or because of violence. Um, we are um, out there in the world showing God's love to people. And through uh, the tithes and offerings that come in, we can continue to do that. In our prayers today, we especially want to um, remember Glenda McCoy, Kim McKimmy, Dean Shale, Pat Swenson, Suda Lucas, Val McKell, and Lorna Strait. And this morning I was told that uh, Joe Sigler fell this week. He kind of passed out and fell. He's at home, he's recovering, he's doing well. But let us continue to remember him. Let us go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Great and awesome God, we come before you this morning and hide in the shadow of your cross. Lord, we are here because we need a Savior. We are here to worship and glorify you and you alone. Lord, you sent your Son to this earth to teach us, to show us the way, to show us how to live, to teach us to love ourselves and others. And then, Lord, he died. He gave up his own life that we might have life and have it eternal. Lord, we thank you for the greatest gift any person could ever need in this world your son's life for us. Lord, you have heard people's prayers. We lift up to you also those who are on our hearts and minds, who just need you this very day. Lord, we pray for our church as we go forward. We pray for our nation. We pray for each and every leader, local, national, and world leader, Lord, Pray that they may seek your guidance. Lord, we pray for the upcoming election that people cannot be afraid to vote, that they carry out the duty of a citizen and vote the conscience that you have laid on each person. And Lord, as we go from day to day and we're still in the midst of this pandemic. We pray for healing for those who are sick. We pray for knowledge for those who are developing a vaccine. And Lord, we pray for safety for all those who are at work, at school, and just going about their day-to-day -day business. Lord, we lift up to you, Kathy White, this morning. Be with her as she grieves the loss of her beloved husband. And be with all those who have lost loved ones during this time. And now, Lord, we lift up to you the prayer that you taught us as together we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you are able, please stand for the reading of the scripture this morning which comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. 
Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I cannot come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered the, his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. O Lord, your word has been spoken, and now as we expound upon it, open up our minds, our hearts, our souls, so we can hear what you are saying to each of us individually and collectively as a church, as a community. In your name we pray. Amen. So this is the last sermon in our series of our discipleship journey. Not the last time I will talk about discipleship, but the last in this particular series. And many of you may be saying, well, thank goodness for that. But hold on, because there's more and plenty to come. So just as a recap, and if you still have your uh, handout, I'm going to go through that. Everybody starts on the beach. It's the world. It's where we're born. It's where we're very self-centered. We live that way, don't we? We are a self-centered people. But at some point, somebody has introduced us to the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. We go to the shoreline, we put our foot in the water just to kind of get a taste for what it's like. Someone invites us to come and see, and we wade in a little deeper. And at some point, we accept Christ for ourselves. And then we go out into the water until our feet come off the bottom as we experience, go, as we go and see for ourselves what Christ offers for us. Many people in our churches remain at this stage or level of discipleship and never venture deeper into the water. It's about fear. It's about control. It's not that Christ doesn't call them deeper. It's that they don't want to go deeper. And then last week, I talked about what it was to go out into that deeper water, to go and make disciples not bashing people over the head with the Bible or even standing on a street corner proclaiming the word. It's about us being Christ for others so that they are attracted to Christ. About encouraging and supporting others. About feeling more of a commitment that worship alone isn't enough. Drawing us into small groups where we're held accountable. Today, I want to talk about 
stage six and beyond, the fully committed buddy diver. You may be wondering why I said, why I'm calling this the buddy diving stage. I'll explain that in just a minute. But first of all, Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Fully committed disciples live by this verse. I love how Mother Teresa put it. Here's what she said. I belong to Jesus. He must have the right to use me without consulting me. Think about that for a moment. It means no long, no, not only do I surrender my life to Christ, but that whatever happens, Christ should lead me in everything I do. We can't do that if we have a hold of our own lives, if we're in control, can we? And it's so hard for us to let go. Stage six disciples are fully committed disciples who have totally surrendered their lives to Christ. This doesn't mean that there are no setbacks. Oh, there's setbacks all the time. And it doesn't mean that they're not going to sin once in a while. Don't tell anyone, but every now and again, even I sin. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you don't go back to waters where you can stand up and take a breather and be around other people, and even go back to the shore to do some worldly living. For after all, we must do that for others to see the Christ in us. But it means that when you reach this deeper stage in your relationship with Jesus Christ, that you more fluently travel between the beach and out into the depths of the ocean of God's when we go out in that deep, it's like a scuba diver. Now, I've never done scuba diving, never really had a desire to scuba dive. But I have snorkeled. Have you ever snorkeled? I taught snorkeling at the Boy Scout camp where I was aquatics director. It's so much fun teaching the boys who think they know it all, snorkeling. We're gonna take the snorkeling award because it's easy and I get the credit. I can swim well, so snorkeling's easy. We start off in the shallow water, learning how to wear a mask, and then we add the snorkel to it. And it's amazing, no matter how clearly you tell them, you're gonna just swim up and down in the shallow water, you'll cross the width, breathing out the snorkel. And when you come through with that, you're gonna take a deep breath and go under the water so your snorkel fills with water. And then as you come up, do not panic. But that breath that you've taken, use it to blow out all the water in your snorkel and you can continue without ever having to stand up or raise your head out of the water. And off they go. They take a deep breath, go under the water, and just about every single kid would then stand up spluttering because they forgot to blow and they inhaled all that water that was in the snowball. We practice in the shallow water because I sure wouldn't want to do that in the deep water first, right? But you get out into that deep water and there's more dangers. You have to know your equipment. You have to know what you're doing. You must know the dangers that are out there and how to avoid them or how to get out of them if you're in them. And you must be able to control that fear 
that builds up when things go wrong. And the most important thing about swimming or diving out in deep water is you must have a buddy with you. This deep water discipleship is not for the faint of heart, but we cannot do it alone. Divers face a lot of danger out in the deep water, but the worst one of all is nitrogen narcosis. Do you know what that is? It's when the nitrogen builds up in your body and the pressure affects your nerve transmission. Divers have known to do the weirdest things. You see, they don't realize that they're affected, but their body will notice it and come to their rescue. Divers have done things like taking off their flippers and walking on the ocean floor, going out deeper instead of back because they think they're on the beach. They'll take off their mask and equipment or try to because they can't think straight. And the buddy who is someone they even trust on and rely on is the one who can save them. All divers are affected, but the effects on each person is different. So how does this correlate to a stage six disciple? Well, first of all, their mission is God's mission in life. That's their primary focus, is God and devoting their life to his call. The danger is isolation. So many people shut themselves off when they're out in the ocean of God's grace, or they think they can do everything by themselves. We must have a buddy with us to prevent us from these dangers. Without accountability and discipline, Christians can start acting weird. They become independent and don't want to be part of a team. They act independently of others and they fall prey to the dangers of the world and their own desires. We have seen it happen in many spiritual leaders in your lifetime and mine who have fallen from grace publicly because they have tried to do it themselves and haven't had a buddy to walk alongside them, holding them accountable. Often, at this stage, small groups cannot take this disciple any further. Maybe you're sitting out there and you have been in a small group or you are in a small group and you're thinking, that's just not taking me anywhere any longer. Maybe you're ready for one-on-one -on -one spiritual accountability and honest sharing with another stage six disciple to, deep, to dive deeper still. I love being in a small group. You share. You share your lives with each other. You begin to trust each other. But I know there came a point for me in my life when I wasn't challenged enough anymore. I reached out to a person who has become my diving buddy. We challenge each other and we've learned to actively listen to one another. I also have a spiritual director. I've told you about that. And on Friday was my spiritual direction day. We're doing it by FaceTime right now. It isn't the same as being together, but it's better than nothing. So I called and we do the formalities. Hi, how are you? You know. 
And then I begin to talk. And I talk and I talk. I know that's hard for you to believe, a preacher who talks, right? <laughs> and about half the time has gone by and I'm looking at her face on my phone. And she's got this huge grin on her face. And I stop. I said, is something wrong? She said, no. I have a question for you. How is it with your soul? And I paused for a moment. And I said, delighted. I don't think I've ever really described my soul like that before. Do you know why I said that? And she said to me, I am hearing that in your voice. You see, I was talking about the church and the things that are going on and the people that I've met and this community. And I was delighted. Isn't that awesome? I'll say that again. Isn't that awesome? Wake up. <laughs> because I am where God wants me to be. And I am delighted. And before we finished our conversation, my spiritual director said, now remind me again, which church is it? Because I've got to look up some of your sermons. I said, oh no, you don't have to listen. <laughs> but the whole point was that I am challenged by her. She always gives me a challenge. And I am more and more in touch with how my soul is feeling. Jesus, when he came to earth, chose 12 men to be his closest friends. He mentored them, he supported them, Now he taught and was present to everyone. But these 12 people were his closest, his small group, if you will. But out of those 12, there were three that Jesus did one-on-one -on -one mentoring with. Peter, James, and John. Because he knew the depth of their discipleship already. Peter, he mentored, mentored to prepare him to lead other disciples and to plant and start the Christian church. Peter, I mean James, sorry, he instructed and taught to become the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And John, John and Jesus had a very special relationship. So special that when Jesus was about to leave this earth hanging on the cross, he entrusted his very own mother into the care of this, the disciple, John. Jesus taught them how to trust in and rely on the Holy Spirit for everything. The Holy Spirit the constant source of power. So you may be saying, well, what's this scripture that we heard today got to do with this stage six disciple? It's kind of a warning. In this story, it begins after Jesus had said these things. So what things had Jesus said before the story? He talked about, if you go to a banquet, don't sit at the seat of honor to start with. Sit somewhere lower down on the table so that the host can come and move you to a higher place. The first will be last and the last will be first. Those are the things Jesus had been talking about. And then he tells this story. A man's having a banquet and he sends out invitations. Now, if you know the story or you were carefully listening, you see that a little bit later, the man sends out a second invitation. We might think that's a little weird, but not really. How many of you have ever received a save the date for a wedding or a party? 
That's what this man was doing. He was sending out, save the date because I'm having this banquet and you're all invited. So everyone knew that this banquet was going to take place, when it was going to take place, the exact time. And when things were set, the man sent out servants to invite them to come. The doors were open. Come, he says, into the feast. And then the excuses begin. Boy, are we a people of excuses. The first one says, Oh, I just bought a field and I have to go see it. He just bought some new furniture and he's going to put it in the house and he's going to try it out. He bought a TV. We've got to set it up on the wall and make sure it works right. The second one bought a team of oxen and had to go try it out. Boy, we can use excuses for work getting in the way all the time for not doing God's work. And the third is the best of all. I just got married. <laughs> what an excuse. <laughs> we can use people as excuses all the time, can't we? To avoid doing God's work. There was no commitment from these people. Other opportunities distracted them from focusing on God. And man, can we do that all the time? For some, the call to a deeper commitment is so fearful that they don't want to go. So they use the excuses. But I want us to think about what happens next in the story. The man who is holding the banquet sends his servants out to invite other people to take our place at the banquet. This is where we are today. We must make a decision. We must either become committed to Jesus Christ and his lead for us, or others will come and take our place. As we begin to move forward slowly, many of you may not like some of the suggestions and changes we have, and Lord, some may even spread gossip. Did you know that that can happen in a church? <laughs> I am going to do my best to be forthright and open. It's what we're about. And I would pray that you will do the same, even if you don't like something. Well, come and tell me about it, but don't talk about it behind my back. There will be changes and people won't like them as we continue our discipleship journey to discover what God has for us. I want to remind you of something. When Jesus was here preaching and teaching and showing love to everyone, not everyone liked it, did they? In fact, it got to the point where Jesus was arrested and killed on a cross for what he believed in. Now that's not going to happen, <laughs> I pray, today. But my point is, we must be together. We must be a team. We must listen to what God is calling us to. And we must go forward. Jesus didn't die so that we could be safe and comfortable. I think I need to say that again. Jesus did not die so we could be safe and comfortable. He died so that we would know the truth of the gospel and pass it on to others. God is never finished with a fully committed follower. God is constantly calling and challenging us to go further into the ocean 
of his love and grace. So as we come to the conclusion of this sermon and this series, I'm going to pray a prayer that is found in Luke 9, 23. And I'm going to ask you to join that prayer with me. So I'm going to tell you what it is before we pray it. I'm going to ask God that we will deny ourselves, that we will take up our cross and commit to following Jesus alone for the sake of God's kingdom. Are you ready to go out into deeper waters with me? No matter the consequence, to set aside the fear and to trust God. Let us pray together. Oh God, right now, I ask for your Holy Spirit to come down and empower us, to strengthen us. I ask, Lord, for the strength that we may deny ourselves, that we can take up the cross of Jesus Christ daily and to commit to following you alone, Lord, for the sake of your holy kingdom. Take away the fear, surround us with love, and let us as a congregation be of one heart, body, and mind. And we ask this in your holy name. Amen. And if you have your communion with you, take it out. I long for the day when we can come forward and be able to take communion at the altar again. Not yet, but one day we will be able to do that. But the beauty of us each taking communion in the pews is that Christ is present right here with each of us in the same way he is, whether we come forward by, by intinction, whether we're kneeling at an altar, Christ is here. Sitting around the table with these disciples that Jesus had mentored and prayed over and chosen. He said, this is my body broken for you. When you gather, take it and eat it and remember me. And he took the cup and again asking for a blessing from his father. He said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins and for the hope of everlasting life. Friends, it doesn't get any better than that. So let us pray. O oh Lord, we offer you this bread, this cup. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon it and transform it into Jesus' body and blood for us. And then as we take, transform it on the inside so we can be changed more in your likeness, more bold, more fearless, to work for you on this earth. Lord, we surrender our lives to you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Friends, take, eat, and drink all.
everyone is called to come to the gospel feast. Friends, don't be left behind. Let us pray. O oh Lord, as we leave this place, we commit ourselves to you again. Lord, let us not use excuses, but let us boldly come forward as you call us. And we pray this in the name of God the Father, through his Son, Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people say, Amen. Please remain seated until an usher